This episode of Heavy Cardboard is brought to you from the great folks over at Gamesurplus.com, bringing the world of board games to you. Now, on to the show. Heavy Cardboard, episode 108, Conversation with Gary Ray. Coming to you from our house in Denver, Colorado, welcome to Heavy Cardboard, where we talk medium and heavy strategy board games, war games, 18xx, and other related topics in the board gaming hobby, as well as other stuff. We're your hosts, I'm Edward. And I'm Amanda. I don't really know how to say this without being a downer. Um, yeah. So we're just going to rip the Band-Aid off, shall we? Okay. So the um, a couple weeks ago, whenever we discussed having a family emergency, and we kind of dropped off the grid for a week and a half or so, it was due to Edward and I realizing that it would be better for us to separate. We have been drifting apart for a while, and lack of a better way to put it, we've been really good roommates for a while, and it became time for us to realize that we just needed some time to kind of figure out exactly what we want and what we need. However, heavy cardboard is not changing. We are still co-hosts. We are still best friends. But for right now, it's best to, like I said, it's best to take this time to make a more firm decision. Yep. That pretty much sums it up. Now, we've been, in the past, we have been very open and very honest with you all over the course of the last four years in regards to us, our personal Mm -hmm. life, and everything else. And so we thought it was important to put this out there for you all as well. Even though the show isn't changing and that we are still best friends and we are still co-hosts and all of that, I mean, let's face it, inevitably, some things are going to change as far as just we're related right but as far as the show same old same old Mm -hmm. that ain't going anywhere this isn't going anywhere the the plan is still eventually to get amanda full-time that's not changing right we wanted to let y'all know what's up and continue that open and honest dialogue that we've had with y'all over the course of the lot well the entire life of the show yeah yeah so yeah so that's where we're at now normally we'd go into a well, whole lot yeah. of other board game related stuff. We're not going to do that this episode. We realize this is probably a lot to take in. And honestly, for many of y'all, it might be just TMI. Like, okay, whatever. Right. Who cares? Right. And if that's the case, then that's fine. But we still wanted to make sure that everyone was aware. Yep. And so, yeah. As always, if you guys have comments, questions, feedback, whatever you want to call this i don't right. know what that would be yeah reach out to us you can whether yeah. it's social media whether it's email whether you guys know how to get a hold of us at this point go to heavycardboard.com you can figure everything out there and now on to the conversation you had with gary ray Yeah, local game store owner in California, as well as the author of The Friendly Local Game Store, which is kind of a uh, a how-to book on how he has found, through trial and error, how to run, be open and run a friendly local Mm -hmm. game store. Big thank you to our sponsor, BoardGameTables.com. If you're in the market for a customized, one-of-a-kind board game table, go check them out, boardgametables.com. Hey, y'all. Edward from Heavy Cardboard here. Happy to be joined by somebody a little bit different and something a little bit different here. I'm happy to be joined by Gary Ray, the owner of Black Diamond Games, a friendly local game store in, is it Concord, California? Concord. Yeah, it's Concord, California. Concord, California, and also a published author now who uh, published a book called 
friendly local game store. So, Gary, welcome uh, to Conversations by Heavy Cardboard. Good to talk to you. Yeah, you as well. So, okay, a little background first. What got you into the hobby? Um, uh, well, I've been doing this for almost 15 years now, and I started because my local game stores were failing me. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, what I didn't understand at the time was I was kind of an outlier customer. So my, my demands and needs were actually far outstripping what they could provide, but I was also kind of not the typical customer. So So how, how so? Um, I tended to buy a lot of uh kind of off the wall fringy stuff i can uh, relate to that yes yeah like i have like i had a full city of miniature building authority for my D games <laughs> that right. kind of stuff. i'm like how come you don't have enough buildings here and and you know and then later i started a store and i carried the full line of miniature building authority and i understood why they didn't have those buildings there <laughs> <laughs> very few people buy them <laughs> that so makes sense I, yeah, so the worst reason to start a store is is because you think you can do better because more than likely you can, but also more than likely you really don't understand why. <laughs> well, let why me was- well, let me ask you, did you just come into the hobby excuse me, did you just come into the hobby cold as far as uh I- I'm talking like gaming-wise, how did you get into the hobby from the very beginning? Um, well, I had been I mean like as personally in game me in yeah, game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had played, I had played, you know, the typical Dungeons and Dragons since I was 12. And, uh, I was, I was running, I was running D and D games for like IT departments in their boardrooms. <laughs> nice. <laughs> During, like, room. And that, you know, cause you know, I was working in IT and, uh, I was just getting really into it. And I, it, it just seemed like the thing to do be surrounding yourself with stuff you love all the time and talking about your character to people <laughs> often as you want all right and it seemed like a natural fit but i was completely unprepared uh in in almost every way i didn't have enough knowledge about uh my my breadth of game knowledge was very weak and uh i had no retail experience uh but i was you know i from my grad school days i learned that if i just apply myself and and research an area uh i can figure it out over time it was the same way you know you get a job, you research the next technology, 18 months later, you get another job with 20% more pay. And I just figured this would be the same thing. I didn't realize how expensive that would be. Like the learning process was incredibly- <laughs> A bit of a curve, expensive. was there? Oh my God. The, I always, I mention people sometimes, I really wish I had the startup losses, right? The startup cash, the, the money I lost in the first six to 12 months. <laughs> I could start a whole nother store So just that. So starting out, so you go from playing D and D and just being your typical gamer, as we all you know started out. I suppose. What was the real, true? You know what? I can do this. Let me go ahead and get started running a store. Um. So I I don't do things just kind of like on a whim. I it look so for some people it looks that way, but it usually <laughs> it's the tail end of a lot of research. So I was at uh. It's interesting. I was in IT at Kaiser Hospitals, and they sent me to do training for a week in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, I started looking at all the game stores in Madison, Wisconsin. Actually, my original plan was to move to Madison. Uh, and my my wife is from Alaska, and she put the she put her foot down on that because she understands what cold is. And I, <laughs> but I wrote my business. I, I hated that job, and I wrote my business plan while doing that week of training. And used those stores as examples, and uh, and then ended up uh, taking a vacation between jobs and and visiting stores all across the country. Uh, and 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 by like halfway back uh, from our trip, I realized I had to open the store. And actually, I rushed back to rush rushed home, skipped part of our vacation to start the business. So was the vacation centered around visiting these stores for research, or was it one of those? Okay, while I'm here, I might as well take a look. It was while I'm here, I'm going to look around and I'm going to, and it was a family reunion. So I talked to everyone in my family about it and they were rightfully skeptical and, and down on it. And uh, like my father told me how I was going to be giving up the best income earning years of my life and like real stuff that was true, 
right? Uh, and then I had one uncle who was just like, you know what? If that's your passion, just, just go for it. Just do it. And uh, I'm like, yeah, yeah, that seems that seems like the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, so right answer or the answer that you wanted to hear, right? Yeah, it was what I wanted to hear. Everyone was right. No one gave me advice that was untrue. Uh, there's just some advice that I liked better than others. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I, I've always lived by the mantra that I would rather attempt and fail than be old and past the point where I can do it and wonder what if. Right, right. Yeah, and I, my life is just a series of midlife crises. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm concerned that there's not another thing coming. So that's my biggest concern. Not that I'm going to fail. <laughs> That's so, that you know that that's an exciting way to look at life though is it not? Yeah, I, I would hate to be I would hate to think I'm going to own a game store and I'm just going to just settle into retirement for the next 25 years. That's a that's a terrifying concept. So it's always uh, what's what's around the next corner then. It's always what's next. And it and, I, and this is the kind of thing where my store is doing well enough it it might be possible that I keep it for the next 25 years, but I certainly hope I'm not doing the same thing for 25 years fair enough so yeah. let's go ahead and talk about the store then so black diamond games well, okay so you heard the advo advice from everybody your uncle said you know what sometimes just like in risky business you just got to say you know what the heck so yeah. how did that begin um i it, so this was the, this was in 2004 so so the housing bubble was 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 expanding so the money was easy because it was home equity uh, home equity money. Right. Uh, and then I borrowed, I actually wanted an investor because I, I really felt like I needed some help. So one of my friends uh, agreed to invest if I wrote a convincing business plan. And doing that kind of research is like what I really like to do more than anything. And uh, I wrote a business plan. It, it was the most painful, it wasn't the most painful, but it was an incredibly painful experience writing a business plan, being honest and writing a business plan. So okay, so let's unpack that a little. What made it so uncomfortable? Um, the thing about writing a business plan is it's it's a lot of hard earned. Uh, there's a lot of hard earned research that goes into writing a business plan, but at its core is complete bullshitting. <laughs> <laughs> So you write, you do all this incredible research and you come up with all of your expenses. And then at the end you go, uh, now I need income projections. So everyone out there, how much money am I going to make? And, and they just laugh at you. Right. And I laugh too. Now if, when people say, yeah, I've got all my numbers except my income numbers. What is the, what is that going to be? And the answer is it's going to be a reasonable amount over your expenses, whatever that is. You just make it up. And uh, if you're successful, then you were right. And if you're not successful, then then it wasn't right. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody knows, and you just have to do your numbers. And if the numbers are reasonable, then you pull the trigger. And if they're not, then maybe you need to move to a bigger city or something. Okay. All right. So uh, after the business plan, then what? Um, then I built the most beautiful store. <laughs> 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 so the one thing that was missing on the business plan that's in that I talk about a lot in the book is the ROI, the return on investment. So anyone can build an amazing game store or or any business if you have enough money and you don't care about the ROI. Sure. If you, if, if you don't mind a ten year return on investment, you can have gold plated, you know, uh, point of sale systems, and you could like the. The Wizards of the Coast store locally here had a had beautiful um, ceramic mosaics in the entryway at the malls, <laughs> right? Nice. It's like completely extraneous, cost, but I heard they cost tens of thousands of dollars. Oof. But you know, if you they got can no afford ROI, it, right? Yeah, yeah, and you got deep pockets, you know, why not? So I built I built an incredibly expensive, really nice store that I wanted to be in, uh, and it actually I actually made it work over time. But I made a lot of mistakes, and it was way too small, and it was never going to satisfy my needs. And then my needs changed when I had a son, uh, when I, we adopted my son, uh, and I needed to do more. And then the uh, and so then we moved to a bigger location, and the housing bubble burst, and and you know all hell broke loose. <laughs> I, I I can relate. We actually uh, we actually bought our house at the very bottom of said housing bubble, so we got lucky on that in that regard. But being right. in California, I imagine that. Uh, that was tougher than it wasn't. Uh, the so 
it was kind of like as long as you had a job and you could make your payments on your mortgage, you were like a gentleman farmer and you could and you could do anything because your house was appreciating like 10 grand a month. Right. So sure. you're essentially house wealthy and, and house proud and, and you just it doesn't doesn't nothing really matters. And then when it collapses, everything matters. Right. And then you have to get serious about what you're doing. And uh, I almost lost my house. Uh, in in that process, uh, I uh, all of my loans and, su- and such were from the house because it was easy, cheap money uh, that really you know never had a time where it really needed to be paid back. Eventually, you just outgrow it, uh, outgrow your loan with your appreciation. Um, so that's a whole other story in the book about playing chicken with the bank. Uh, but I eventually eventually did not lose my house, and I eventually came out ahead. Uh, I made them. I made them eat about two hundred thousand dollars of negative equity in the process. Well done, which, sir. Well done. And now the house is up about three hundred thousand. So that's my that's the, my only smart financial decision I've probably made. Is- <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the book. How did that come to be? So was it one of those just you know what? I've gone through a really hard process of figuring this stuff out on my own, and you know what? Let me go ahead and write about it and try and help, you know, kind of uh, pay it forward kind of aspect. Um, no, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the way, the way it came about is kind of, it's, it's it kind of a roundabout way. It's, which is I have a business, I have a business partner and we talked about doing uh, consulting work outside of, of the game trade. And uh, this is, uh, remember I was talking about like, being afraid of like this being the only thing left and not there being a next thing. Right. So I'm always looking for the next thing. And he gave me a list of things that he, he's, he's, uh, he's a financial planner and he's got other, all these things, all these irons in the fire. So he, for me to be useful to him, he wanted me to do some things, uh, to, to move, move this forward. Right. So he gave me a list of things like writing a business plan for this consulting business. Um, you know, doing mar- doing marketing research and like uh, this long list of things. And one of the things on the th- on the list was write a book, right? And he had written a book, and uh, so you know he put it on the list. And of all those things, writing a book seemed the easiest. <laughs> wow! <laughs> but I've been writing a blog for ten years, um, right? And so I've read I- I've read a fair bit of it. It's it's a pretty interesting. Uh evolution of things it gets gets better (laughs) as you go through it (laughs) but i wrote up i've been writing a blog for about 10 years so writing a book seemed like it'd be easy in fact i was i was wrong but i thought it would just be i could just take some of like my best of blog posts and make them make them into into book chapters and as it turned out it was much more difficult than that because the form the format is completely and utterly different between a blog post and a a book chapter so i ended up taking ideas from the blog and then having to expand them greatly in the, in the book chapters, which was, which was great, but a lot more work than I thought it would be. Okay. Uh, okay. But we still, we, it, I mean, from, from, I mean, I announced uh, from a, a, pretty much from a year to the day of my announcement, the book was done. The book was out. Uh, but I announced on my blog that I was looking for a publisher and I found a publisher within about a week that wanted to do the project. And then we brainstormed it and we just, I just started writing right away uh and like i said it was it was difficult to do but it was you know it was just work it was just more of the same kind of work i've been doing for the last decade so uh yeah (laughs) so so in the book the fact that you you give actual numbers so were you at gamma do you attend the uh gamma trade show each year uh i i go uh every couple years so i was at the last i was there in, in the last one, March was the last okay, month. Right. Yep. God, I was just there. So, and I, I give presentations when I go. So I did, I usually do presentations with numbers. So I, I, I do open to buy and marketing and turn rate analysis and all that stuff. So here's uh, my question for that, because when I was there at Gamma as well this year, I noticed that there were, uh, when I talked to fellow local game store owners, that they were one of the things that they were really excited about was being able to talk openly about their numbers and like a guy in 
North Carolina can openly discuss something with somebody in San Diego because they're not direct competitors and they don't have to worry about somebody stealing market share in their own neighborhood, so to speak. Is there Was there any fear or any apprehension about that with with regards to putting that out there in the book? Well, the book, um, I didn't put my numbers out in the book. Um, like the closest thing to my numbers is I, I mentioned that our store does over a million dollars a year in sales, which right. is which is true. But I don't use my store really as an example because what we're what I'm doing in the book is I'm building a store. Uh, I'm building a model using the the goal is to in in the book is to obtain a middle class income in five years, right? Mm-hmm. Which is like fifty five thousand dollars. It's it's a very modest goal. <laughs> to spend five years in a bunch of capital to make a middling income. Right, <laughs> right. So, right. Um, so that's the model in the book. And uh, it's it's actually, I, I, when I finished with the model and it all worked together because it had to all work together, I was like, oh, this, this would be kind of a nice store. And I could imagine some of these stores out there being like this one. So um, the biggest concern when you're comparing numbers is uh, alienation more than competition. How so? <laughs> Most game stores most game stores don't do a lot of revenue um so most game stores are more in the in the 150 to 200 thousand dollar a year range which i mean and this is all speculative this is what our, the thinking is because no mm-hmm. one has its numbers and if i walk in with a million dollar a year store i have to be relatable to that person with a two hundred thousand dollar a year store right so I'm looking for commonalities and processes and procedures that work for them without, you know, alienating them. Uh, like I'm already working on a presentation now called finding your unique value proposition and that unique value proposition could be very expensive and it could be, f- most of them are going to be far more expensive than the entire, you know, capitalization of a small store. So I'm, I then have to find ways to relate to the smaller stores. Like here are things you can do that are heavily labor intensive, but, have the same results as a hundred thousand dollars of capital, that kind of stuff. Okay, fair enough. So let me ask you then: Is this book strictly for? And it's kind of an opening a question in a sense that I, I I kind of know the answer, but who is the book for? It's not just for those that are interested in opening up a local game store, is it? No. So the the book bounces between chapters. It, it it has kind of like a here's how you would build the store, and then the other chapters are um, are here are all the terrible things that happened to me while I was right doing the narrative mine, right right because right. everybody wants to hear the narrative they want to hear the terrible things that happened because uh, <laughs> I didn't want to write a store on how to I didn't write a book a book on how to open a game store because I've already done it and those books are boring to me I, I have no interest in that I wanted to write a book that I would find interesting myself. And other store owners would find it interesting, but also um, non-store owners would have some insight into how it all works. And the thing about gamers is they're far more interested and curious about the business side of this than than say like if you you know owned a furniture store. You know, gamers are into systems and they really want to know how does this work? Where do these things come from? You know, how does how does the system put, how is it put together? And- uh, honestly, that's that's where the these series of interviews came from. Was I think of myself as the world's biggest five year old? I want to know the why and the how about the behind the scenes stuff and being able to talk to folks like you, kind of, you know, pulls the curtain back on some of this. So I so I'm kind of an exception because I'm obviously the author, but I don't I don't pimp the book in my store, right? I have co- I've had copies for about two months now. And I've been selling, I keep them on the counter and I sell, I've sold like 21, 22 copies of the book to customers as they come in without them. Know, most of them don't know who I am as the author. Right? Oh, that's funny. It's just, oh, hey, that sounds like an interesting book. And you're like, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Imagine that. <laughs> and, and occasionally one of my employees will be like, if I'm there, which a lot of times I'm not, they'll go like, oh, would you like the author to sign it for you? <laughs> and then I'll step up and go hey that's pretty cool so what was what was your favorite part of writing the book then um well i really like the the systems right so um so there's two two things that i enjoyed one was the roi section of the book because that was a section that i didn't do on my own business plan uh which was a big mistake 
So I actually had to, I had to find a model that would achieve the goal of the income that I promised while doing it in the time frame that was reasonable. And that was kind of interesting from a systems perspective of trying to get that to work. And it turns out if you do it the way I did it, you would actually make a lot more than the middle class income if you were to compress it all into like a five year ROI. Um, so that was fun on a, on a, for me on a, you know, technical side, but I also enjoyed kind of really opening up my life in the narrative section. Right. So I've told some of the stories in, in my blog about, you know, personal things that happened and like with the house and, right. and, and, and adopting a son and suddenly your life completely changes and you're no longer a gentleman farmer, but you now need to be a professional retailer. So that kind of stuff kind of opening up the kind of like diary uh, biography stuff was actually quite a bit of fun uh, as well. All right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. That stuff. So I had a friend who also, who read the book and she, she mentioned uh, uh, she, she had a couple of questions that she wanted yeah. me to ask. And I, I think they're actually pretty good that kind of the motivation. Now I understand that your business partner, you know, had this list of things and, and writing the book seemed the easiest, but wonder if it's kind of like the impulse of gamers that want to make player aids so on bgg on board game geek users you know make fan created player aids for their favorite games they're not making anything out of it they're not you know maybe they they learn the game a little bit better or whatever but it's more i'm not going to say entirely altruistic but kind of that idea so kind of the book kind of feels almost like a, a player aid for those interested in opening a local game store. Does that make sense? Does that makes total, that makes total sense. And, and I do, I mean, every day when I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking of something to write on the, in the blog cause I enjoy the writing, but I also Just the enjoy the process of the process of writing, but I enjoy that, that tickle in the back of your head where you kind of see a process born or a system that no one had thought of actually maybe exists, you know, like there's correlations and you never put together. And that's really interesting. And then being able to write about them and making them maybe useful to other people. I mean, a lot of times it's just observations and nobody cares, but you know, one in 10 times they're like, ah, I can use this. This is actually a useful player aid <laughs> or exactly. a DMs aid or something. Right. 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 Um, so that's kind of, I guess that is a motivation. I had actually, actually hadn't thought of that, but that's kind of my process. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so you, as you said, you're not there at the store a whole lot. So how did you find your managers? How did you find the best managers that you have? How was that process? Um, so I used to be there more <laughs> than I am now. Uh, so I found my, it's, it's, oh, it's, it's kind of funny cause I, we moved to a bigger location and I had already decided that, that there were going to be things that I wanted to do and there were things that I didn't want to do. Uh, and it didn't really matter what everybody else was doing. There were just things I didn't want to do. I didn't want to run events personally and I, I didn't want to be I didn't want to be managing anybody. <laughs> I didn't want to be a manager of people because okay. I did that. I was a manager in the IT world and what I realized was if you're a professional manager, it really has no correlation to managing people making minimum wage at, in retail because their you know their needs are different than a professional who generally shows up and does their job every time because that's their their goal in life right so i didn't want to manage i didn't want to run events so i had I, I had a guy who had helped me move the store who over the period of a few weeks and learning uh more about him realized he's a really sharp guy and he wanted the job <laughs> Right. Uh, so I made him my first manager and he did all the management of people. He did, did all the management of events. Uh, and then from there, I was more a contributor. I tried to contribute more processes and procedures, you know, working on the business instead of in the business. That was my goal. But I still worked the counter for another six years after that. I think a total of like nine years before I finally had to step away. I just really had to not do that anymore. Why is that? Uh, um. I just got, I think after nine years, I was just burned out on it. Sure. And that makes total sense. And I was becoming a dick. 
<laughs> you know what? A uh, self self evaluation, I think, is really important, and and I think that ultimately that's going to help the be- uh, the business. Then, if you realize, you know what, I'm not helping things because my attitude isn't so hot with things I, anymore. I had a bad attitude, and I couldn't fix it. And uh, I had a new manager at that point. I mean, at that point, we had a system, so we were able to train in new people and kind of groom them and do all that. And uh, I had a new manager at that point, and I said, you know, you know, I just don't think I can do this anymore. And it was kind of one of those existential crises where you don't know what's next, right? You're like, maybe I need to close the store. You know, maybe I'm just done. And I, so, so I said, yeah, I can't do that. I don't think I do this anymore. And she said, well, then don't. And I kind of stepped back and realized, like, I don't need to Wait, do this. I can do that. Yeah. I can do that. I mean, the <laughs> And I tell the story of the baby elephants, right? So in the circuses, they put the chain on the baby elephant's leg and he pulls out it and he can't get free. And then the elephant gets bigger and it becomes this giant adult and they still, it still has a chain around its, you know, its leg. And, but it doesn't pull because it has already learned when it was a baby that it can't get free, right? And that was kind of where I was at. I just like, I couldn't get free because I didn't think I had the ability to do so, but I did. Uh, and so that's just I kind of conditioned yourself. I conditioned myself and I'm like, I'm going to work in the office and office things. And, and whenever you're working the counter as a store owner, you have a, a folder of projects that need to be done when there's time. Right. And the, it's like that 10% of time between customers. And they tend to be kind of half ass projects because you've got other things to do, even though right. these are like business building activities that are critical to your success. They're just not that important. But they always uh, find a way just, to be sloughed off because it's not a matter of if there's time, it's making the time, right? Yeah, exactly. So I decided this is going to be my new life was doing these things here. Uh, and so I devoted my life to that and finished everything in like three months and then said, what do I do with the rest of my life? So <laughs> have, you, have you answered that? No. <laughs> so it's part of writing the book is kind of the what next question. So, all right. Uh, but that's fine. It's all part of the process. <laughs> Speaking of kind of process, the camaraderie of small business ownership and and fellow local game store owners. Is there is there a camaraderie or is it more you versus me type thing? Um it would be it would be a mistake for a store owner to think it's confrontational. Um it's it can be confrontational in the in the local market, and I consider my local market within about ten minutes. So, uh, like I'm half an hour from Games of Berkeley and in stores like Endgame, and those are great stores. And I send people there all the time, and they send people over here. And customers often think we're enemies, <laughs> when in fact we're more friends than enemies. Uh, and then when we go to these trade shows, this is kind of the t- some some time to kind of uh, peel off into groups of like-minded individuals and uh, compare notes and you know tell war stories and all that. Uh, so it's a lot more. Lately, it's been a lot. Uh, there's been a lot more camaraderie than I've seen in the past. So I actually look forward to going to these shows and meeting with the kind of the same groups of of people. So why why do you think that shift has happened? Um. I think Facebook has made it really easy to uh, not only just separate out game store owners so that they can have conversations, but there's even subgroups of store owners that are kind of like invite only uh, groups that, that, like I said, like minded folks who, who, uh, you know, are, are have successful stores and they're not necessarily big stores, but they're people who think in a, in that kind of, you know, successful store manner. Uh, they have they they have the right idea of what it means to run a store, uh, the same kind of ideals. Well, okay. So let me ask then: What would you say are the most important aspects or most important ways to think about uh, to make a successful store, both from a store owner standpoint as well as you know to make it inviting for your customers? Well, the f- the first thing is it needs to make money. <laughs> It's obviously, a, it's a, sure. It's business. I, you say obviously, but a, but a large proportion, maybe even most store owners, don't think that way. Why, they, why do you think that is? Because that seems so foreign to me. Because they, they generally came as um, 
hobbyists. They came as consumers and hobbyists to the to the business. Uh, they don't. A lot of them don't really know what it takes to make money, so they don't know how hard it is. Um, it's the kind of business where the where the if you ask somebody what they think the net margin, net profit margin is for for a business, most people think it's like 30, 40 percent, when in fact it's more like five percent. So you're always threading the needle to profitability. You're always it's it takes a tremendous amount of work to run a profitable business, uh, and if you don't if you don't do it 100 percent, you don't get it. You don't get that, and you fail. and And the turnover in the game trade is tremendously high. It's very high. Um, so finding people that understand, uh, first and foremost, is about profitability. I mean, already you've got a subset, a small subset of, of, of owners. Um, and then, of course, it's about the customer experience, right? It's about, it's about serving the community and building that community. You don't, you, don't get to, you don't get a profitable store long term without thinking long term and thinking about customer satisfaction long term. You, you, you don't get... Uh, Here's, I have an example of a store. There's a store owner I know who's retired now. He sold his store, and one of his one of his failures was that he 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 did not court a whole generation of gamers. <laughs> he forgot he forgot the youngest generation of like the Pokemon age kids. And as his current crop of customers grew older and faded away, uh, he had no one to replace them. And his store failed. His store was he was done. He sold it, but it was essentially had no gas left in the tank. Uh, so that's kind of, we're always thinking of like, where is the pathway? I mean, I've I've got my average age might be twenty seven, but I'm looking at the twelve and thirteen year olds. I'm like, how do I get them engaged? How do I make them stay? Right when my son is thirteen, and and like something like seventy percent of them are are glued to their Xboxes, right, and glued to their iPads. And, and like like no generation before, how do I get them to engage in tabletop gaming uh, when they have so many other distractions in their lives? Uh, so yeah, that's kind of that's the thinking. So it has to be long term customer satisfaction. And when you do that, you naturally build good stores. I think. Uh, and why does it seem like this seems to be the exception versus the rule? Because. Me, obviously, you know, running a YouTube and podcast, uh, YouTube channel and podcast, there are certain things that are intuitive to me that don't seem intuitive across the board. And for you, being a local game store owner, that obviously you coming at it from a business background, or not really business background, but from a business standpoint, that seem obvious as far as making it a welcoming and warm and comfortable environment for people to want to come into your store and give you their money. Why, right. why does this seem to be the exception? Because when I was at Gamma, I saw all these local game store owners and I thought this is fantastic seeing this because all of these people that are here own game stores and they're actively wanting to improve, whether that's you know their bottom line, which obviously that makes sense, but also just how to make it a better community building experience and environment because that's a win-win all the, all the way around the board or as far as makes them more money. And like you said, looking at that next generation perpetuates the hobby, which helps everybody long-term. So why, why does this not seem, why, why is that such a hard concept for what seems like so many game store owners? Do you think? Uh, the the money it's money so the revenue is in is in magic is in is in cards sure right? CCGs right yeah with so so it's very easy to build a, a card shop card shops are cheap to build it doesn't cost anything but it's a self limiting model that doesn't doesn't attract the general public and therefore doesn't attract women and children so they tend not to care that much about that but at the same time they're never going to make any money in their in their businesses at the whims of the magic market, which goes in cycles, it's very painful. Uh, so, and part of the book is talking about capitalization for a, a, a store that meets your meets your long term needs, and that capitalization is not cheap. It, it's the example in the book is about a hundred thousand dollars for a store, and that's an incredible amount of money for most people to consider plowing into a game store. Most, most there's stores. There's a store right now on Kickstarter. 
where their plan is $35,000 to start a game store. And we're kind of laughing. It's like you're doomed from the start. I was going to say, that seems very short-sighted. It is short-sighted, but most game stores are short-sighted. And, you know, I guess if there's not a lot of money put into it, there's not a lot of fear of failure. (laughs) But you... In order to attract the public, you have to have uh, a build out that attracts public that doesn't scare away half the population, which is women who, by the way, control more more than half of the purse strings. Right. (laughs) Who have to control the money. Uh, No one's going to let their child into your store if they're afraid to go there, you know, or if it's if it's if it's dirty or if it's in a bad neighborhood because you couldn't afford rent. Uh, So most of the game stores are essentially trying to find a place to play magic as opposed to trying to find a viable business model that'll take them long-term and meet their goals. Um, and, kind of, and the book is kind of like, here's how you here's how you would do that other kind of store. Uh, and it's not easy, and it's definitely not cheap, uh, but it's, it's a model that works. It's something that's sustainable. It's something sustainable, and, and it will meet your needs. And that's kind of how, I didn't say that say this originally, but the kernel of my business plan was, um, cause I was, a pr- I was already like 35 and I own a home and I had a wife and I had needs, <laughs> I have needs. So how do I run a business that will, that will satisfy my needs? So my salary was the kernel of truth within my business plan that everything else was, was built around. And that's how I wrote the book where, okay, we're going to get you, we're going to get you to this number. You're not going to get to it in the first year, but we're going to get you to your middle class income number. And then everything else will go around it. Uh, And then, you know, at the end, it's kind of like, okay, there's a little bit of, you know, you know, push and shove in each direction on how we're going to get, how this is going to be, how it's going to happen. But here's where you start. Because you had a bit in the book that uh, if I can quote you here real quick, it says, uh, if you want to take a vow of poverty, join a monastery. If you want to start a small business, decide how much money you need to make, which that kind of goes in line. uh, Whereas because it seems in this industry, so many people expect businesses to run based on, you know, the quote unquote love of the hobby as opposed to, oh, yeah, hey, it's a business. We're supposed to make money or supposed to make money in a sustainable business model to support people to live and, and, and be able to support a family. Right, right. And, and I have I have some regional competitors that I kind of see as the monastics right there. I mean, I really I think they do a great job and they're a great they, they provide a great benefit to the hobby community, to the, to the hobbyist community, right? They do a lot of things that are very selfless. But they don't make them any money doing it. Um, but at the same time, they're kind of giving up their lives to do this. And if you love it, that's great. Um, but if you have financial needs, which is most people after they've done this for a while, you know, you've got to, you've got to provide for yourself. You've got to make smart decisions and, and nobody's getting rich, right? There's no rich game store owners, right? So if you're, if your net profit's 5% and you're doing a million dollars, you know, a year in sales, that's only $50,000 of net profit. Uh, and maybe you have a salary. So let's call it, you know, 85, make $85,000 after five years, maybe for me, me, it's a lot longer than five years. That's not, you know, anybody who can do that can do something else for a lot more money. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, so, and it's, it's just not easy to, to make any money at all. So it's not like you can, you know, do it half-assed, which is what a lot of people do. So, okay. On that note then, why do it to begin with? If you're, if you're not going to, I mean, if you're not struggling, but if you are fighting to get to a middle-class income, and for the most part, that's kind of where you're going to be capped at. My question for you then, Gary, is why even do it? It's a it's a high intelligence, low wisdom kind of. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's so complicated for me. I think it's so complicated that I really want to solve the equation. I really want to figure out the model to make it work. And that takes a it turns out it moves really slowly right? Like an IT, I would be out of, I would be on to my next job in 18 months, 18 months in retail. Nothing is different. You know, the paint on the wall is chipped a little more chipped, but that's about, it's about it. You know, there's not a big change. So you're, 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 you're constantly shifting and we, you know, it's the big thing is two, they say two steps forward, 
uh, what is it? Two steps forward and one step back. That's the game trade, right? So you're constantly uh, doing a new thing, and you're and it works for a while, and it doesn't, and then you're you're a little bit farther back, but you're a little farther ahead, and you you go on to the next thing, and it's it's wickedly complex enough to keep someone who's tr- who likes to solve problems interested forever. <laughs> So it so it's the masochist in you that is like you know what I can beat this I can figure it out and I'm not gonna quit until I figure this out. It's like that, yeah, yeah. And eventually you do kind of hit some plateaus where where you kind of I call it like cr- cracking the nut. You know, you cover you cover your nut where you 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 get to profitability and and then like everything else I do from from the next for the next five days is half mine. You know, it goes from your net profit margin. I mean, your net your net's about five percent, but then like after you've covered all your expenses, it's more like forty five percent. And you're like, oh my gosh, I found the money. I found the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> and I used to play poker professionally online before the government took it away. And covering that monthly nut that you said is that's kind of exactly okay. Hey, I made the bills for this month, and now everything else is gravy, kind of off the top yeah. of that. I get that. Yeah, how do I have more of those? <laughs> right, yeah, no doubt, right? So I'm looking yeah. at the calendar for Black Diamond Games here. Uh-huh. And I noticed that there's there's a fair bit here of board game night because in my head, it kind of goes back to what you said as far as to be able to be a, a sustainable local game store. It's got to be CCGs, Warhammer, you know, 40K. Those have to be the, the meat of the bones and then, then maybe you can do the board game stuff on the side. Well, but I'm looking at this. There's D and D. Obviously, there's a fair bit of Magic, uh, and and Pathfinder. But there's actually a a fair number of board game nights here in the month of May. So well, is what, that true? What, I guess is what I'm yeah. asking. That that there has to be a core around the CCG and you know 40k universe stuff, and then board games on the side. No, there's no there's no universal model for for product mix. Um, we actually sell more board games than we sell magic, uh, so it kind of makes sense that we have a couple nights of that. But not everyone can do that. In fact, I think there's probably one board game leader in every local market, and we're we're that. So if I open if if I have a competitor nearby, they're not selling board games like I am. I used to be the other guy. I know how that works. <laughs> I had to have our, our main board game uh, store retire. The owner retired after a number of years, and I kind of took up the mantle and became that store, Which which, but I was there for about four years plugging away, doing what I could with board games until that happened. Um, and and as far as far as our schedule goes, we had a we had a big build out. One of our our kind of our next big thing was building a second floor for our game center, because uh, we thought kind of our, one of our unique value propositions was to become a regional hub of gaming, of of gameplay. So we built a second floor, and there's a whole section on the craziness and financing that and all that. But we went from like 60 seats to 120, and when when we started the project, magic was hot. So we figured. We were building this for the magic players because we would get easily. We figured we would fill this with with that with just them, right? And then by the time the construction finished, magic was dead. Magic was in a down cycle, and we had built this thing uh, possibly for nothing, right? For no reason. That's terrifying. And, and none of our events until the last weekend uh, ever exceeded the original space, right? <laughs> so it's been like a year. It's been a, the, the first year no one, no magic event exceeded the original space, which was like 65, and we can see like 121. Um, but what did happen is we we added we added more nights for more of these other other game segments and satisfied all the demand for RPGs and all and the board game people really wanted two nights and I was against it and I gave it to them and they've used it so that's been good um, and our sales skyrocketed because game space equals in-store sales uh and that and we succeeded not because of magic but because of all the other people that came uh now the magic's on the on the upswing again maybe that'll (laughs) increase even more 
Uh, and I think that's important because we don't have – we have a local game store here uh, about an hour north of where I'm at here in Denver, Colorado called Haunted Games Cafe that we go and try and support even though it's about an hour away. Uh, we go up there and play a few years – or a, a few times a year for sure. And yeah. I'm of the mind that if you're going to use the game space, support your local game store, right? Isn't that kind of the – the idea behind it that, you know what, if I'm going to use your space and I'm going to game in your area, then you know what, it makes sense for me to, you know, spend some of my hard earned cash to pay it back for use of the space, or at least that's how I see it. And I guess that's kind of the the idea behind expanding that space, right? It 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 works that way. I mean, I don't, I don't think it requires uh, a lot of uh, preaching to the, to the, to the, to the congregation that that's what they should be doing. It just happens that way. And there's going to be people who always buy online and they will continue to do that. There's going to be people who buy local and they'll continue to do that. And, uh, by having the space, by having the events and by having the product in the store, you naturally increase sales. And when I moved to, I, my first store had no event space. I moved to this bigger store with consciously with event space. And this, it had this roughly the same product mix because I had invested like thirty thousand dollars in toys, which completely failed <laughs> my my toy attempt. So with the same inventory, our sales with Game Space uh, went up sixty percent. Wow! Uh, instantly, right? It just went up sixty percent, uh, and then and then it just went up from there. And it was no, no additional product, just having that event space. And by doubling our event space. Uh, a couple years ago, it went up 15%. So it wasn't obviously not the same percentages, but it had a similar effect. And we also do a pay-to-play program where you where the only event in the store on event nights are those events. And if you're playing in those events, you pay $5, and then the $5 goes towards store credit. So we're not charging them $5, but we're ensuring that they're customers. And some people will spend that $5 on snacks and drinks, which is fine. And some people will very carefully save that $5 a week for that $50 board game that they want. Uh, that's, that's their budget is, is that just so like a layaway program. I didn't right. Yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. So it, it's both types. And, and that just a lot, what it really does is it keeps you from wanting to strangle customers. <laughs> Cause if you, if you give away something for free, people will take advantage of you. They will, they will take it. Uh, and if you, and, and they won't value it either. If you value something at nothing at zero, then they don't, don't, don't see it as valuable. So when people do pay, they tend to be protective of their space. They tend to clean up after themselves. They tend to defend it against those who, who, who don't believe they should be paying, <laughs> you know? So, uh, and that, we've been doing that for nine years now. So that works out or has worked out pretty well. It's, and there's different models for that. So the last question that I have about the game space then is how do you ensure that it's a welcoming space, I guess, for anybody that comes in there? And you would mention, you know, the, the, the significant others as well as, you know, the younger generation of either gamers or future gamers. How do you ensure that it, it, it stays that, that friendly local game store instead of it just being a local game store? Um, we, I mean, there's a, there's a, I suppose there's a vibe. (laughs) I suppose there's expectations. Uh, we keep the place very clean. We're, we're incredibly organized. We don't, you know, there's not garbage and product on the floor. We hire, uh, and promote friendly staff. I try to keep a balance between men and women because, you know, you might think you are keeping things clean, but you know, uh, you don't really know if your restroom's clean as a man, I think, until you've got uh, female employees. To talk to <laughs> eight um, and we have we have volunteers that we we vet and make sure that they're uh, giving the right message. Uh, and it and it tends to work out. We and we and there are some times when we've had to cancel events where we just couldn't crack the nut. We just couldn't figure out how to make our say our Yu Gi Oh community, you know not victimize each other or not, you know, not steal everything in the bathroom that's not nailed down or, or have the police come coming out once a week. So sometimes Oof. we have to say, this isn't, this doesn't fit in our, in our environment. So uh, hey, if you can't, if you can't play nice, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do it type thing. We're just, 
and we're not going to do it. And, it, and we, we dropped Yu-Gi-Oh when I was making $100,000 a year in revenue on Yu-Gi-Oh. And we, I basically said, you people need to go away now. <laughs> so sometimes you just have to do that. To- but you have to be able to uh, – well, no, I, I don't want to make that assumption. You Is that a – is that something that you could have decided uh, had it not been a m- bigger part of the bottom line, I guess is what I'm asking? Well, I mean, if it's a big enough part of your bottom line, you you make, you make you find systems that will work uh, to keep it going. So so I didn't I, it didn't just happen overnight. There, we had a, there was a point in which we had Yu-Gi-Oh! essentially video games, dual terminals in the store that mm-hmm. they – Konami had conned people into buying. Uh, <laughs> and we hadn't paid them off yet. <laughs> so I, I, I refer to them as my golden handcuffs. And I wasn't going to get rid of Yu-Gi-Oh! until the dual terminals uh, were paid off. So the question then was, how much staff, how, what procedures do we need to make Yu-Gi-Oh! work uh, until it's time to stop? And we did things like airport security bag checks where they had to check in their bags. We we made them wear name tags so that they had, you know, accountability. Exactly. So it's not anonymous dude, you know, acting a fool, right? Exactly. You know, um, we would, there would be, there would be collective punishment. (laughs) That's awesome. So so we had this problem where like one of the people would go to the restroom and while they was while he was gone, someone at the table would steal his bag and the others would would find that hilarious and just laugh about it. So we would punish the table. You know, we would like say that table's now, you know, th- that group is punished. <laughs> so they, so it, it becomes Roman Roman uh punishment, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, wow, really? It wow. It's that bad, and every and there's gonna be there's gonna be people that say, "Oh, my Yu-Gi-Oh group is fine." It's like, well, my group's more hardened than your group. What can I say? And eventually, uh, and the and the police were coming because they would like there'd be assaults where they would they would like they would like punch someone and take their cards and run out the door. Uh, and we did everything we could to keep it under control. And then once those dual terminals were paid off and they were wheeled out the door, uh, usually, uh, you know. As a, you know, losing money on eBay sales or whatever. We I think we sold the last one for four hundred dollars on eBay, and once that thing was out the door, there was some event. There was something where they were angry because Konami had changed the format, and we were following the format. And they had protested and gone across town to another store that day. And uh, I I sent the message. I was at I was at I was eating dinner at a restaurant. I told staff, let them know they're not welcome back. Just don't come back. All right. So let me ask you, why do you think then it was specific with your store? Why do you think it was specific to that one game, in this case, Yu-Gi-Oh, as opposed to, say, Pokemon, Magic, 40K, whatever? It's most it's most people have a problem with this game, but there are the ex- occasional exceptional stores that have managed to that don't, you know, if you're in a rural area, you're not going to have essentially Yu-Gi-Oh thugs because they it tends to be a group of kids mostly who kind of see themselves as hard, you know, they, they're not, they don't play any other games. They just play Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, and, and, and they're, they're kind of, they kind of see themselves as, you know, thug card players. <laughs> and I'm That's not a sure. Thing? What, Am I that old that I'm like, really? It, it's a thing. It's been around for a while now. And it's, and I, I don't know what to make of it, but we, we just couldn't, we couldn't kick it with them. And we just couldn't, couldn't fix them. We couldn't fix that group you know and they would just they would find happiness in victimizing each other and we just had to wow. eventually chew them out of the store huh. all right learn something new today all right fair so, enough so when you have a community like that in your store it's very hard to say you're a family friendly venue right so um we had people that said they wouldn't come while they were there and we had people that came back when they were gone but we pretty much gave them a time slot that was kind of dead to us anywhere where no one was coming. So it was a low risk thing for us. Like I just tell them, don't come Sunday afternoon. Cause that's when they'll be here. We weren't even open before. Now we are just don't even use those hours. Wow. But that's, that, that's yeah, a, the handcuff statement kind or term kind of, kind of seems appropriate here. 
Yeah, yeah. And every once in a while, I threaten to bring Yu-Gi-Oh back if, this, if sales don't improve. So <laughs> That's funny. Staff don't appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Any uh, any final thoughts then for for those folks that are out there that are contemplating the crazy idea of opening a friendly local game store? Well, get the book. Uh, the book should su- successfully both scare you off, and if you're not scared, <laughs> should provide a roadmap, right? Because it'd be really easy just to scare people off and tell them how terrible it is. But I mean, I enjoy, I still enjoy doing it, um, or a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it. Um, and there's a and there's a useful path in here to at least start that conversation. It's not the only way, clearly not the only way to start a store. Uh, but it's a good way and it's, 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 if you read it and you have a lot of concerns or you think you can do it a different way, it's a great conversation starter with people who know what they're doing because they're going to want to know you've done some work and you're not just kind of, you know, a a magic player who wants a place to play on Friday. Fair enough. All right. So, so Gary, how can, uh, how can folks, uh, either find the book or, or get in touch or stop by the store? Uh, I, I have them on sale at my store and they are, they went live on Amazon today. Today is the release day, May 1st. Very cool. Congratulations. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. And you can get it in print or Kindle edition on Amazon. And I believe drive through RPG has some other formats, uh, you can get it, uh, on and all of the game distributors carry it. So game stores, you can ask your game store owner to bring one in. For you as your local game store to bring one in and, uh, and the name of the book is friendly, friendly local game store yep as simple as it sounds easy enough and yep. black diamond games you want to give the address for any folks that are stopping by in concord california it's 1950 market street uh in concord and you can also just go to blackdiamondgames.com and you'll find all of our directions and facebook links and stuff like that and and uh address so awesome yeah. well i appreciate it. this is see and like i said i'm the world's biggest five-year-old so getting this behind the scenes stuff is it, it's interesting to me and i imagine if it's interesting to me it's interesting to other folks out there so i really appreciate you taking the time today to hang out and well and discuss this part of the industry that doesn't get a lot of a lot of coverage uh when it comes to you know podcast youtube etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah it was fun talking about it Thanks for, thanks for having me on. Cool. All right. Take care, Gary. Thank you. That was a great conversation. I'm glad you enjoyed that. I mean, <laughs> you did have to listen to it since I, you edited it. That right? is correct. All right. So, yeah. Um, I guess we just put a bow on it and... And call it good. Like, and, I don't know what else to do. Yeah, saying. I don't either. So, you know what? We're not going to make this awkward because... Is it awkward for you? Nope. Is it awkward for me? No. It's just it's where we are. Yeah. So you know what? Like I said, or like Amanda said earlier, show's not changing as far as y'all are going to see it, realize it. We're still the same people. Yep. We're still best friends. Mm-hmm. This is just where we're at. That's right. Bye. See y'all later.